Hello, everybody. Welcome back once again to the Factory Tour. I'm your host, Paul Patterson. I'm uh, here today with my good friend, Ben Winkler. He's a dynasty analyst and ranker over at Dynasty Football Factory. And he's also one half of the Always Be Building podcast. I uh, managed to get both hosts on back to back. I talked with Drew Pettiford last week. Now we've got Ben here. Uh, he is a an Anthony Richard enthusiast. Uh, and your stat of the day about Ben is that he is actually younger than the movie Shrek, uh, which <laughs> oh I think God. is pretty interesting. Uh, so Ben, how are you today? I'm doing great, man. That was that was good. I actually didn't know that either. So <laughs> have you seen the movie Shrek? I have seen the movie Shrek. Good. A few times. Okay. Yeah. That's good. I'm glad. I'm glad you're. You know, that's an important piece of our culture. I think it so. is definitely. I've seen um, all of them actually. Not to brag, but. Wow. Okay. Well, great. We've got your, your wise beyond your years, clearly, <laughs> uh, which is good. We're going to need your insights today. We're diving into some tricky rankings. We're going to try to fit some rookies in alongside some veterans in the rankings. We're going to talk about the running back position in depth. Uh, and then we're going to close out the show today with some roster management tips. Uh, just kind of go over some things we're trying to do as we move into the summer past the rookie draft season. So it's a full show sheet. We're going to dive right in. We're going to start off with this rookie rankings game. You sent me a list of some guys that you like in this class. Some guys are a little bit higher on. So what I tried to do is I went over to keeptradecut.com, um, that wonderfully flawed website that gives us some up-to-date market rankings. And I just grabbed some names of veteran players that are uh, sandwiched together with some of these rookies that are coming in. And mm -hmm. I just want to kind of sort through with you where we view these rookies in relation to these veterans, because we've been seeing how the rookies stack up against each other for quite some time. Now we have everybody's rookie rankings. We know how they should go in the drafts, but once these guys get into your, you know, onto your roster, uh, how do they stack up against other guys that you could get? Uh, so that's, that's what we're going to look at. We're going to start with Sam Laporta tight end who went to Detroit in round two. We're going to look at Sam Laporta, Greg Dulcich and Darren Waller. So we've got these three tight ends that are all adjacent to each other in keep trade cuts rankings. Ben, how do you see these three? This one's really tough for me. I'm not going to lie. This is probably the one that I got hung up on the most because there's like a reason for me to be scared of all of them. And there's a reason for me, like a really good reason for me to like all of them. For Dulcich, who is probably who I'd put first on this, mm -hmm. he to me is the one I'm just generally the most excited about. He really popped on tape. Um, he was a good separator and he was great after the catch and I'm kind of excited to see what Sean Payton does with him but that's also what makes me really nervous about him is I have no idea if Sean Payton's even gonna like him because uh, he was part of the regime before that and uh, I just really don't know what his role is gonna look like in that offense so tentatively I'd put Dulcich at one um, I'd put Laporta probably at two of these three um, I got really excited at that draft capital um he immediately vaulted himself up to one of my top targets i have a bunch of shares now um been smashing that in like the mid second round of all my rookie drafts it's probably one of my favorite values so far and For then sure. uh i'd go waller at three i'm a raiders fan and uh waller was really really aggravating this season i've been a waller owner um in a lot of my leagues and it was just uh really frustrating and it's cool that he got traded for and it, that shows some level of investment from the giants um but i'm really not overly excited about his athleticism and how that pairs with daniel jones uh so yeah i'll pass it over to you but that's how i'd rank okay those. totally totally fair i also had dulcich first um i think I, I agree with a lot of what you were saying he was very exciting as a rookie um you know statistically I, I really wish I, I pulled it up. It was one of those things I wanted to look up and I just forgot, but his, uh, his yards per game that he put up as a rookie was actually pretty impressive. Historically speaking, it ranks as one of the best numbers over the past 10 years. Uh, he, he was actually surprisingly productive in the games that he played. It's just that he suffered injury at the beginning and the end of the year. Uh, and so I think people kind of forget that he was really good for a stretch because it was like right in the middle of the year it's easy to forget but he was very productive and as far as the sean payton stuff like i don't know i guess there's always a risk that a, a player isn't a fit with an incumbent coach but it feels like we do kind of bring that up arbitrarily like yeah, for sure good like good players typically just succeed like regardless of their circumstance um you know or i should say at least regardless of, of coaches and that for the most part we don't see coaches come in and 
discount good players just because they're not their players and what they've done at tight end, you know, bringing in Adam Troutman, um, other guys that I think they brought in Chris Manhurts. Like these are blocking tight ends. So I feel pretty confident that he's going to still have that full-time pass catching role. Uh, and he's a guy that I've been trying to buy because I think you can actually get him for some of these other tight ends like Sam Laporta. I think you could trade that pick directly for Dulcich in a lot of cases and and get that done and i feel more confident in him i think he's more likely to produce sooner just because we all we all know rookie tight ends take some time to get acclimated so i like that i did have waller second out of these three but for me it's really close and i feel like it it's kind of a cop-out but it's like where's your team at right if you're if you're competing i think waller does present enough upside at the position that i'm willing to take him on at his age um I don't like to be stuck in the middle at tight end where you get kind of that mid tier production without the uh, ability to accrue value and without that kind of weak winning ceiling. But I think Waller still does have that because, you know, we know that he is a good athlete. We know that he is able to command targets and he is in an offense that's kind of got a target vacuum going on where there are a lot of wide receivers in New York, but none of them necessarily are very imposing as target earners. So I feel like we could see him as the dominant target in the offense, if he still has, you know, that juice that he's had in years past, he could have 120, 130 targets and, you know, make a difference for your team. So it's, it's scary in the sense that his value could drop off very quickly. It, it's just also tough to invest so heavily in a guy like a Laporta who we know isn't going to produce as a rookie. Um, but yeah, that's, that's where I'm at with these three guys. It's really tight. I, I, I guess we'll move on to the next three because I probably shouldn't spend the whole show talking about tight ends. Um, <laughs> so those are our thoughts on those three guys. I would hope Waller gets used kind of like an X receiver too because it feels like he's the closest thing they have to like an outside ball winner. So I feel like there could be some really good red zone work for him. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like you said, it's there's just so much risk that his value just falls off. So Yeah, I guess I, it's like he's probably better at any alignment than any wide receiver they have on the team like yeah. if you put him at x you put him in the slot you, wherever you put him he's going to be the best receiver on the team i'm not really afraid of isaiah hodgins wando robinson's coming off the acl you know yeah. jalen hyatt's a field stretcher like there's there's room here to thrive but you probably need to see some step forward from daniel jones for it to be super exciting um so our next three we've got some wide receivers here we're going to be comparing with josh downs uh, rookie for the Colts, rookie wide receiver for the Colts, went in the third round. And let's compare him against a couple of year three wide receivers that have been uh, a little bit underwhelming thus far in their careers, Rashad Bateman and Elijah Moore. Uh, so, Ben, how would you slot those three guys into your dynasty rankings? Rashad Bateman of those three is my number one. Um, and this one for me is actually a pretty comfortable slot for him. I'm pretty into Rashad Bateman and I'm super into the Ravens offense this summer. Um, I've been hyping it up all off season, acquiring Lamar shares, acquiring Zay Flowers shares, acquiring Bateman shares. Um, and I think that the way that they've constructed their receiver room is just really friendly to all of them. And it's really friendly to Todd Monken's system. They have a bunch of guys who are super explosive, who can separate and who have um, good ability to catch the ball. So they just do everything well that you want to air it out, which seems like, the plan for this year. Um, so Bateman to me profiles as like a Z across from maybe Odell at X, and then you put Zay in the slot, and then you have three absolute speed demons who can juke the crap out of anyone, and you've just got a great receiving core. So I'm really excited about Bateman. There's a little, definitely some concern about target competition there, which I would say is totally valid. And if that scares you away from him or if the injury scares you away from him, which is probably a bigger concern with Bateman, um, I totally get it. But anyone who like has followed my Twitter over the past six months has learned that I'm very much an upside chaser. And that's to me the the pick here for um, of these three. And then at two, I think I'd probably go downs over Elijah Moore. Um, I'm not super into the Browns. I'm not super into Deshaun Watson. I don't really like anything that's touching that offense at the moment. Um, and I'm super high on Anthony Richardson. And I think that at some point he's going to figure it out. And I think that Downs is going to benefit a ton from that. As far as figuring it out, I mean, like, I think that, uh, I think that Steichen's going to scheme up a lot more short game stuff than Richardson was doing in college. And I think that that will cater a lot to Downs' strengths 
getting him open in the flats, uh, getting him some work after the catch. So I think that Downs could enter as a pretty high volume kind of receiver. And I think that he's good enough at separating and good enough after the catch that he can make something happen with those kind of targets. So I'd go Downs two and then Elijah Moore three. Okay, very interesting. We followed the same pattern for both of these because we have the same number one. Uh, again, it's Bateman. I agree with you. The upside is there. You know, you have to make some bets with Bateman for it to pan out. Like you need the Ravens' volume to increase under Todd Monken, but we think that that's you know a reasonable possibility. And then you kind of need him to be that presumptive one in the offense, right? So it kind of. I don't think with Andrews there, you're going to have room for a lot of fantasy relevance for both Bateman and Flowers and Odell, depending on you know what we think he has in the tank. But a bet on Rashad Bateman is just basically saying, okay, I think he will establish himself as the best of these three, which I think is totally doable. I don't think the other two options are so imposing that he can't be the lead target earner there. We have seen some promising you know yards per out run stuff from him so far in his career. It's just been it's been small sample. He's dealt with injuries. He's dealt with like limited snap shares and stuff, but Greg Roman is gone. So it's, it's a whole new regime. He's going to have the opportunity to earn that every down role. Um, I loved him as a prospect, so I'm still willing to buy in at his reduced cost. And then after that, you know, more and downs, I feel like we're kind of splitting hairs. Neither one is a guy that I really, really want to go out and acquire right now, but I think you make a good point about downs in the sense that, you know, he, I think the fact that he's a rookie gives him a little bit more grace. Whereas if Elijah Moore struggles, the bottom's going to fall out. Like this is kind of his last chance to prove himself. Um, but I think generally speaking, I'm just higher on the Browns offense and lower on Anthony Richardson as a passer than you are. So we're just sort of flipped there where I, I kind of foresee a world where the Browns pass more that Deshaun Watson shows you know who he was pre-suspension um whereas richardson has a low pass rate maybe a low completion percentage and uh you know it, that's a little bit more of a run heavy offense and i also have concerns about downs being off the field in two wide receiver sets playing only in the slot potentially so i think that's where we differ is just our offensive outlook but i think both these guys could play similar roles in their respective offenses it's just which one is going to be more fruitful and i think maybe i lean towards the browns Gotcha, for sure. That's that's definitely a, like a valid and like there's there's a lot of reasons to uh, not be scared of the Browns because Watson was an elite quarterback the last yeah. time we saw him with a full off season and a full season under his belt. So yeah, I mean, obviously the vibes are weird. Like I, yeah, the it's, vibes. It's are a super tough situation. Weird. The contract it, is gross. It's just yeah. Ugh. It's like I mean, first of all, I mean, just Cleveland in general is kind of like there's always bad vibes around Cleveland quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. And then the fact that this Cleveland quarterback has his own whole set of, you know, bad vibes, it's kind of hard to separate that out from what we expect to happen on the field. Uh, but I do, I do lean more towards him recovering his ability just because in terms of his physical condition, you know, he's 27 years old. He didn't suffer some kind of devastating injury. He just took time away from the game. It seems like more likely that he would remember how to play football again and, and be good again. But it's hard to quantify the mental aspect of, you know, everything that he's dealt with. So who knows? Um, we'll, we'll see how that pans out. We're going to move over to the running back position here. And we're going to take a look at Kendra Miller in the context of some veteran running backs going in his vicinity. Uh, so we have Kendra Miller, third round rookie to the saints, and he's going in the same range as cam Akers and Joe Mixon. So how do you feel about those three guys? This one's tricky, and I can I have a very strong feeling that me and you are going to disagree on these three. Um, I think that this one definitely, not to state the obvious, but it definitely depends on your team build for sure. If you're a youthful team build, Kendra is easily the pick of these three. Um, but if you're a contender, and this is where I think me and you might disagree, is I'd probably go Cam Akers over Mixon, and then Kendra third of these three as far as like if I was a contender. Uh, I'm... My first article for DFF was a Cam Akers article. I'll admit it. I'm such a Cam Akers homer. Like, I love the guy. I loved him coming out. And he was like my first dynasty darling. Um, and that injury really broke my heart. So that's what I wrote the piece on. Um, anyways, I think Akers is primed for a big 2023 season. I think that um, him, Swifts, and Taylor could all have really, and Dobbins especially, could have really big uh, years, kind of like how we saw Jacobs in his contract year do for the Raiders this past year. 
I think that that's a really underrated aspect of playing Dynasty is knowing when teams are planning to run their running backs into the ground and knowing when they're trying to save them and elongate their careers a little bit. So I could see Akers getting that sort of let's run him into the ground treatment. He was in the doghouse last year. There's sort of a rift between him and McVeigh. So I could sort of like see a world where his success in the back half of 2022 kind of rolls over into 2023 and he becomes a really, really high level producer. So I, I like Cam Akers a lot, especially mm-hmm. for a contender. Um, sure. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we disagree too much at all. Um, yeah. Let's. I, I have them in the same order. I have Akers, Mixon, Miller. Let's start Sweet. with Kendra for a second, though. So mm-hmm. I know you are a fan of Kendra Miller. I'm not a big fan of him as a player. I didn't like his profile too much. Just wasn't a – mainly it's the receiving aspect that I, I, I question his ceiling as a receiver in the league yeah. uh, based on the way he was used in college. But he's a good rusher. Um, so I guess walk me through, like – your take on Miller and why you would be lower on him in a contending. I guess it seems like it would be obvious, but you know, we expect running backs to kind of produce right away. And the ones that don't do tend to lose value. Right. So yeah. if you're not, if you don't have a ton of faith in Kendry at year one, are, are you just a very big believer that he's going to be able to do enough to capture this role where they're not going to bring in, you know, another dude next year and they're going to just kind of let him go from there. My thing with Kendra is he's he's a super young prospect. He's like still 20 right now as we're as we're recording this. Um, and I just my, the way I see his rookie year going is I see him starting super slow, probably not getting any touches. And then I think it's one of those things where by the end of the year, sort of similarly to Cam Akers his rookie year, honestly, by the end of the year, he's taken the job over from the incumbent Alvin Kamara and then uh, the other new arrival in Jamal Williams. I think that him and Jamal Williams kind of profile similarly as football players. Um, So I think that that's not a bad, and that's not a bad guy for him to be behind and sharing a running back room with. Um, But I do think that having both of those guys there is seriously going to limit his, his, uh, his ceiling as a rookie. I think that as they get older and start to age out and he gets older and starts to, develop more into a complete all-around player i think that that's when his when his production is really gonna start to pop so i think my concern with him is that i agree with you that he's gonna have a hard time establishing himself this season unless we get some kind of lengthy alvin Kamara suspension um but if we don't you know he's going to be in some form of committee with these guys and i guess i see it playing out kind of the way we saw things play out with rashad white where we, we might even see some flashes, but by the time the job becomes his, we're already going to be in that mindset of like, well, are they going to replace him? Are they going to draft another running back? And his dynasty value is just going to stay depressed sure. uh, until we know that that situation is resolved. It, it's like, I don't know if I foresee him doing enough to cement himself as the clear starter where he can accrue a ton of dynasty value. Um, and so that's why I, he's not a guy I'm like afraid to miss out on, I guess, but he does have a chance to get a role here. It's actually funny because it's kind of the way the depth chart is similar to when Kamara was drafted and the, he also came in in the third round and they had just recently brought in Adrian Peterson. Mark Ingram was there. So he was like the third guy on the depth chart. Um, unfortunately, I don't think Miller's the same kind of dynamic talent that's going to necessarily transcend in that spot. I would agree. But, with you there. <laughs> yeah. But like you said, he is super young. If he does enough as a rusher, you know, efficiency wise, he certainly could enter next season as their starter, and that could end up being a very lucrative spot for him. But with Akers, jumping back to the top of both of our lists, uh, I do disagree with you that I I don't think he has super high-end upside just because to this point in his career, they haven't used him as a pass catcher, and I I still don't think they're going to use him in that way. But he is definitely primed to get a ton of carries, right? The only competition they brought in is Zach Evans in the sixth round, who I do like as a prospect, but a sixth round running back is not a heavy investment. They had nothing behind Cam Akers. They certainly don't want to be giving carries to Kyron Williams. I, I can't name another running back on the depth chart. So, you know, regardless of the Evans addition, they needed someone in there in a depth role. But Akers, unlike last season, is the obvious guy at the top of the depth chart. He should be getting the bulk of the carries. And you know, hopefully this offense can bounce back a little bit with Matt Stafford back and healthy. And uh, the offensive line certainly can't be worse than it was last season. So, yeah, I think there's definitely some hope for Akers with like a, you know, a high-end RB2 uh, ceiling. He's still 
relatively young because he came into the league so young. So I see him and Mixon kind of similarly. They're I don't think either of them are very good. I, I don't think either of them are going to get a ton of targets, but Mixon's in a slightly better offense. Acres is a little bit younger. It's it's just it's a little bit of a toss up, but I'm comfortable rolling with the younger player in Acres. I will add too that the the jump that Acres made over the course of last season in his pass protection was like incredible. He he was literally that was what was playing him off the field, and like it was just disgusting. Every game you every game I'd watch, he would give up multiple sacks or hits on Stafford. And then towards the end of the year, he was literally like ending up on Twitter clips because he pancaked guys. And his, <laughs> his, his pass protection really took a step up, which I think mm. makes him a safer guy to buy into because he, okay. he'll, he'll be able to find his way onto the field for sure. That's a really good note. I did. I, yeah, I had no idea running back pass protection is certainly one of the things that I know nothing about. So that's a good call. Maybe he can earn himself some more third down snaps, maybe get a few more targets in that way. Um, we, we shall see. Either way, his price is pretty palatable. He's going as a RB24, I believe, in a Dynasty Startup. So not a not a prohibitive investment by any means. Uh, let's talk about three more running backs a little bit further down the board, the Dynasty board. We've got Alexander Madison, Roshan Johnson, and Brian... Uh, Oh my gosh, I almost said B. John Robinson. Uh, I don't think he belongs in this discussion. Brian Robinson, the other B. Robinson that's going to be put into all of these uh, trade offers this year, trying to pull a fast one on people. Uh, how do you see these three? Because there's a lot of there's a lot of heat on Roshan Johnson right now. Like people are really into his landing spot. People think he could be the starter right away. Do you think that's a possibility? And does that put him at the top of this list, or are you looking a different direction? It does put him at the top of the list for me. Um, I think that as far as just comparing him and and Brian Robinson goes, you're getting a reset on the age. You're getting a improved landing spot in a similar role where it's like a pretty crowded committee and you're not really sure if the high volume or like elite workhorse role is going to be there, but you know that they're going to be running the ball a lot um, so that there will be touches to be had. Um, so yeah, I'd go Roshan one and then... Brian Robinson too, and bad analyst moment. Did Alexander Madison leave the Vikings or did he stay? Alexander Madison is still on the Vikings. He was re-signed, so he is currently their RB two. Yeah, I'm not really a handcuff kind of guy. Obviously, it's a little different with Madison though because there's this growing cloud of Dalvin Cook leaving. So honestly, with that information, I might go Roshan one, Madison two, Brian Robinson three just because I don't see any upside with Brian Robinson. I think that that's like eight to 10 fantasy points is what you're going to call a good week. If he gets like 60 yards and a touchdown once in a while. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas Roshan, we've seen him get involved in the receiving game. Um, and that's going to be a, hopefully the best rushing offense in the league or up there with, your Philadelphia Eagles. And then as far as Madison, that's just like an upside swing on, I hope he gets the role. So yeah, exactly. I mean, when you're rostering running backs this far down the rankings, like you're chasing upside. Yeah. Um, I have Madison first just because I see the clearest path to a high volume role. Like it's, it's a pretty binary thing, right? If Delvin cook gets cut, then you could definitely see Madison getting the work. I know there's some hype around Dwayne McBride, or, you know, the Ty Chandler truthers. I think it's most likely that they're going to use Alexander Madison in a high volume role if Dalvin Cook goes, if he gets traded, if he gets cut. So I don't know if I think that's the most likely outcome, but I think he has the clearest path to an every down or, you know, close enough to an every down role. A guy that could see high volume touches, high value touches in the passing game at the goal line, et cetera. Um, and then I'll go Roshan. I, I, think that Khalil Herbert's being a little bit underrated right now, at least by the people that are pounding the table for Roshan Johnson. I don't think Khalil Herbert's role in the offense is going anywhere. He doesn't necessarily have to be a 250 carry guy to seriously impede Roshan Johnson's ability to score fantasy points. Like he was very efficient on his carries last season and the year before that, you know, 150, 160 carries. He's going to be very effective on those touches. I don't think they're going to take those away from him. Uh, just because they drafted a running back in the fourth round. So between him and Deontay Foreman, who's been pretty efficient, I just think Roshan's a little bit capped on his value, uh, volume upside, at least this season. Uh, and as a fourth round pick, 
I'm not really looking to, you know, buy in and then wait for the breakout. Cause that usually just doesn't work out with day three running backs. Like you need to see a role happen right away. And if it doesn't, they're always going to be at risk to be replaced the next season anyway. So I'll take him second. And then Robinson, it's like you said, there's just not a lot of path to upside. I'm not going to, I won't belabor the point, but the guy had like six targets last season or something. Like he, he doesn't catch the ball. He had a receiving he, touchdown. He did have a receiving touchdown. That's true, which is more than Josh Jacobs has had in his entire career. Uh, that's a that's just you're a Raiders fan. You should know that. But yeah, Josh Jacobs zero receiving touchdowns in his that career actually somehow. Is, that it's news to me because he's <laughs> one he's of the actually craziest stats receiver. out there. Yeah, he yeah. is. It's just a weird thing. But yeah, Robinson probably won't have a receiving touchdown this season. Uh, he he he's not a very efficient runner. He's not a receiver of the ball. Um, we've already got the hype reports about. Antonio Gibson getting more touches. We'll see how that plays out. I'm ready to get hurt again. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I just don't see the ceiling there. Like he's a guy you put in your RB two slot when every other running back is on by and you yep, can't wait to much. take him out. So I, I really, I don't have any interest in rostering him. Um, all right, perfect. Let's get on to the last group here. We have spent longer than I anticipated, but this is the, this is the big one. This is the most exciting one. We've got Jackson Smith and Jigba, the, the clear 106 in rookie drafts. Very exciting. First round pick by the Seattle Seahawks. I want to pit him against a promising rookie from last season, Drake London, uh, and also another one of his teammates, DK Metcalf. So how do we sort these three guys out for Dynasty? This one is definitely a doozy. These guys are ranked back to back with a little Devonte Smith sneaking in there in my rankings. Um, and I have them London Metcalf and then JSN. Um, that indicates that I'm low on JSN. I'm not low on JSN. I just actually really like the other two guys too. Um, I think Drake London has a super, super nice profile. And I think that he does a lot of things well that I really value in receivers. I love receivers with good frames and, Drake London has absolutely a prototypical frame. He's an underrated separator, in my opinion. Um, he's put in some really good routes. He's got great footwork, um, and it really pops on tape when you watch him, in my opinion. Um, I know that that's a big concern for him, but for someone of his frame and overall measurables, I think that that's an underrated aspect of his game. Obviously, DK Metcalf is a physical specimen. We all love DK Metcalf. Um, one of the most fun players to watch um just an entertaining entertaining watch for any football fan uh and then jsn is a little bit interesting because i think that i think that as a football fan those other two really pop out to me but as like a dynasty asset i feel like i'm a little bit lower on jsn than i maybe should be so yeah it's it's tough i have it i have london first as well i'm very happy to hear you do too i yeah. i honestly i saw a tweet about why you should be trading Drake London for JSN. Uh, and I, that was what inspired me to put this in here because I just strongly disagree with that. I think with JSN, you're hoping that he can replicate what London already did last season, which was a top five target share in the NFL, you know, really strong per route numbers. Uh, it's all subdued by this really disgusting offense that he was a part of that had the lowest pass attempts per game in the NFL and, terrible quarterback play from Marcus Mariota, not much better from Desmond Ritter. And, and that really suppressed his counting stats. But when you actually look below the surface at what these wide receivers are doing, he was really, really impressive. And so I'm buying the heck out of Drake London. I know that he still has Desmond Ritter as his quarterback. I know that they still profile as a, as a run heavy offense, but honestly, pass rate is very volatile. It fluctuates a lot year to year. We're not always as good at identifying situations as we think. So I'd rather just buy into a guy I know is really good and hope that he doesn't get the DJ Moore treatment and just kind of flounder in mediocrity for five years. That can obviously happen, but that could happen for anybody. Uh, honestly, like we don't know for sure that JSN stepping into a, a significantly better situation for his part. He's in a crowded offense. I, I don't think that necessarily matters for his long-term value. I do think it subdues his projection for this season a little bit where he could have stepped into a more open depth chart and commanded a much higher target share right away because I think he is very talented. Uh, now playing with Metcalf and Lockett, he's probably going to be capped, but with what he can do in year one, I still think he'll be efficient. I still think he'll show us what we need to see to push him up the board a little bit. 
And honestly, the reason I want to take him over Metcalf is just that I think Metcalf has finally reached an age where his value is going to be very closely tied to what he did in the previous season. Um, you know, we see wide receivers once they get to that age 26, age 27 season, they need to produce above their expectations to hold their ADPs. Like otherwise they just sort of slip a little bit further down the board every year. We've seen this with like Stefan Diggs, Devonte Adams, et cetera. Like even if they meet their projection, the problem is that that's another year burned off of their, you know, produce it, productive seasons. And so the next year we get to the startup and now it says 28 next to the name instead of 27. And the fact that they were good last year doesn't do quite enough to buoy their ADP and keep them in that like round three conversation. So I, I kind of feel like with Metcalf, he's going to start slipping down the board, especially with JSN being there in that same offense, potentially taking, you know, even more targets away. Uh, whereas with JSN, I just don't really see him. I don't see any way that he's losing dynasty value. And and so with him already being right there with Metcalf in startups, I just kind of see these guys as two ships in the night that are going to be passing one another in, in about 12 months. That's some great imagery, man. <laughs> but it's it's super true. And the other thing I wanted to mention was that uh, despite the limited sample size, the splits with and without Ritter for Drake London were super promising. So hopefully, hopefully he, that is maintained um, yeah i think they had more attempts per game with with ritter mm -hmm. he had maybe and also Pitts was out of the lineup so that does skew things just a tiny bit but yeah i i mean i just don't think it can possibly be as bad as it was last season i i guess that's where i'm at and that's not super analytical but that's just how it feels i i, I don't know i don't think ritter is a star by any means but i think he can be an effective distributor with the weapons that he has so He's uh, better than right. Mariota. That's it. For sure. Yeah, just about everybody is. Uh, we're going to jump into the next section of the show here or maybe pick up the pace a little bit. We're going to talk about the running back position. We've already covered a few guys, but we're going to go in a little more depth because this is the position that is really the most in flux at this point with the NFL draft and free agency. The moves that are made at this time really affect the running back uh, landscape. Some guys just get absolutely tanked in their value. Some guys can secure their starting jobs. So it's very volatile as we've seen with guys like Kenneth Walker, even having guys that we thought were established young stars in the NFL, having significant competition added to their backfields. It's just, it can be tricky to navigate. So what we're going to do is talk about a few running backs. We like some, we don't like, and uh, I'm going to be bringing up their ADP is both in startups as well as on underdog uh, for seasonal drafts, because the thing about running backs is so much of their value is tied up in this season's projection that it's really important to me when I'm evaluating running backs to see like, what are they expected to do this season? I think that's a very big indicator of whether they are maybe over or undervalued in dynasty, because we've seen like over the past several seasons, guys like Kenneth Walker, Najee Harris, Javante Williams, DeAndre Swift, Miles Sanders. These are guys that were, at one point in time considered foundational assets for your dynasty team guys that you need to build around and you know at age 21 22 and they're going to give you multiple rb1 seasons all during their rookie contracts and for one reason or another all these guys have let you down so i kind of feel like we're past that that idea of picking up a running back based on what they're going to be three four years from now and it's more so what are they going to do for me this season um and, and we'll figure it out from there uh so I don't know. Do you have a similar approach, Ben? How do you approach the running back position just in a broad sense? I mentioned this on the last episode of me and Drew's show, but the way that I've started to look at running backs more and more as I've gotten sort of deeper into my like process um, has been sort of looking at how teams use their running backs just as much as how good the running back themselves is. Because um, I think that we've seen plenty of running backs with perceived all the talent in the world, guys like DeAndre Swift. Um, but if a team refuses to use them or prefers to use a committee or a duo or something like that, which is where the way that I think most of the league is trending, um, that's going to be more important, in my opinion, to, to their dynasty value than the actual player themselves. So like Josh Jacobs, I think, not to bring him up again, but he's a great example of that, where he might not be the most talented runner in the league, although I think he's definitely up there. But the way that he got used last year was just an elite three down roll, and it turned into an elite season. So that's sort of what I really am, have been looking for more. I got you. Yeah, for sure. The situation does uh, come into account. It's It can be hard 
for me to figure out where the player's ability and you know begins and ends and where the actual system takes over you know like if you drop a zamir white in you know is he gonna take on the same role as josh jacobs probably not so it's kind of you have to kind of marry the two together right the the ability and the coaching tendencies together uh, but when you can do that then you can really hone in on those guys that you want to be targeting uh, let's start on the negative side here and let's touch on some running backs we want to be getting off of our rosters uh, and I, i'll start us off actually with a guy that i think we both agree on which is javante williams so javante is one of the best examples i think of this discrepancy between dynasty value and current season uh, expectations because he is currently going as the RB15 in startups uh, per the Bulletproof FF uh, ADP. But on underdog, he's being drafted as the RB29. Uh, and that's obviously because he has the injury that he's coming off of the ACL. He, people are expecting some subdued production early in the season at least, and that's pushing down his price. Um, but honestly, this feels like a trap. You know, We don't want to be buying into young running backs on the basis that they're young, because as we've seen, these situations change so dramatically. So if I'm not getting a player that I feel confident you putting into my lineup this season, I'm probably not buying into that player, especially at the cost of, you know, a fifth round startup pick. So Ben, tell us a little bit about your thoughts on Javante. I really liked Javante coming out of college. He was actually my RB one in that class over both ETN and Harris, um, pre-draft. Um, and I was I was super in on him. I think that I think that broken tackle or like the ability to break tackles, I think, is a super important aspect of of the running back position and what makes what separates good runners from bad runners. So I really like Javante as a player, but I feel like it's just bad process to not sell him at the value that he's at right now because you're just insulating yourself with a mid to late 24 first if you can get that. And that looks to have a, um, a pretty good running back class and then you can replace Javante with another young running back, you get a reset on age, you get to wipe the injury slate clear. It just seems like the logical thing to do is uh, get what you can for him and consider yourself lucky. Exactly. I Yeah, I couldn't agree more because, you know, if he's not a guy that you can really use for high end production, you can replace that production for a low cost. So if you can move off of him for a much more insulated asset and then backfill that production with somebody much cheaper, you know, somebody down the board of the ADP, you know, somebody like, um, I don't know who's, who's here on the running back ADP, you know, you can get Aaron Jones for half the price of a Javante Williams, and he's probably going to score more points. Somebody like he's James Connor. Right now. Yeah, exactly. So you can get somebody like that. Who's going to fill that spot in your lineup. And in the meantime, if you can ship off Javante for like a 24 first or uh, a younger player who, like you said, isn't injured, who's going to maintain their value. I feel like you're kind of solving two problems there uh, that Javante just isn't going to solve for you. So at RB15, I just think he's significantly overpriced. We saw last year J.K. Dobbins, super talented runner, coming off an ACL tear. You know, we saw his path, right? It's not the same for every player, but he came back, he struggled a little bit, had some setbacks, eventually came in and had some good games. But ultimately, I, I don't really see what it got for him because he's now a year removed from the injury. He's barely older than Javante Williams, and he's going later in startups. So I don't know. I guess I just don't really see the path for Javante this year to reclaim his status as like a high-end dynasty RB1. It kind of feels like there's some anchoring bias here from when he was the RB2 overall in dynasty, and people just don't want to let go. But I think you should let him go. You can't just hold on to these guys because you liked them originally. You have to adjust to their new circumstances. Um, let's jump off to the other side here because I did mention J.K. Dobbins. I believe that's one of the players you are looking to buy. So what's the difference here? Javante versus Dobbins. Why are we selling one? Why are we buying Dobbins? I guess the difference would be perceived price because I feel like you can get Dobbins for a lot cheaper, and I think that he's got a better shot at producing this year than Javante does, and I think that... If anything, um, that's what you should be looking for at the running back position. Like we, like we just talked about, is what can you do for me now? Um, I mentioned earlier how into the Ravens' offense I am, in, I am, and that goes beyond just the pass catchers because when there's passing yards, there's rushing touchdowns, there's red zone work, there's more love for everyone whenever an offense is flourishing, and that's just what I what I'm projecting for the Ravens as a whole. And I think that he's just going to benefit a ton from it. So I see a lot of 
I could see Dobbins going for like a cool 10 to 14 touchdowns this year for sure. Yeah, I think there's this perception that if an offense is going to become more pass heavy, that that hurts the running backs. But genuinely, the opposite is true. Mm-hmm. Uh, more pass heavy offenses are usually more efficient, which means they score more points, which means the running backs can score more touchdowns. It also means they get more targets, which are significantly more valuable than carries. So I don't think Dobbins is going to be a guy that we see gets, you know, 65, 75 targets, but he can see more targets than he has seen in past seasons, uh, especially with a new coaching staff that might trust him more in those situations. And we know that he's a good player. He's very efficient. Even last season coming off the injury, he was efficient. He's still significantly, uh, he's still young enough to be productive. Like he's 24 years old. There's no reason to be jumping ship because of his age. And as you know, being a year removed from the ACL, he's more likely to be productive than Javante. So as just a point of contrast, like we said, Javante is the RB 15 in startups going off the board as the RB 29 with Dobbins. He's cheaper. He's going off the board at RB 19 in startups, but he's being drafted on underdog as the RB 18. So people are clearly bullish on him producing this season and somehow less bullish on him in dynasty. And that just doesn't add up. These guys are close enough in age where you should absolutely prefer the guy that is going to score more points this year, because we are not good enough at predicting out into the future to know what these situations are going to look like. What we do know though, for sure is that Lamar Jackson is the quarterback of the Ravens. He's got a long-term contract. That's always going to raise the floor of the offense. As long as JK Dobbins is there. So that's at least one point in his favor. But like I said, I'm swung just on the, on the near term production. We didn't even mention that Dobbins is in a contract year too, which is another, in my opinion, super underrated thing that you should look for in like a short-term dynasty buy window. Um, Cause I think that that just generally creates a pretty, pretty big production boom. That is a good call out. I forgot. I forgot that whole 2020 class is coming up on their, uh, on their contract season. So that's interesting. So Deandre Swift, obviously in his last year, Cam Akers contract year, uh, Jonathan Taylor contract year. That could it's going to be, be interesting. Yeah, that could be that could be pretty fun. All right, let's uh, let's cover at least uh, one more buy and one more sell. Let's start on the sell side. Do you have a running back you're trying to get off your teams? Uh, I I should probably talk about Austin Eckler. I tweet about him a lot, and I think about him a lot, and I just really <laughs> really don't like the football player there. I think that the importance of having a dominant force on the ground really got highlighted in their wildcard game against Jacksonville. And it was just a glaring hole for them. They couldn't pick up any rushing yards in that second half. They couldn't take any time off the clock and they just kept kicking it back to the Jaguars. Um, And I think that not to just totally blame Austin Eckler for everything, because there's some blame to go around for everyone. Offensive line could have been better. Brandon Staley could be better. Justin Herbert could be better. But at the end of the day, having a really small and not physically imposing running back as your very high paid RB one. It's just not good coaching. It's not good management. It's not good. It's not good football. Um, So I just find it hard to see. And I know that they didn't draft anyone, which is something I was really expecting them to do. Um, To me, that's just doubling down on it. It gives you more of a sell window for Eckler because they're, they can't, they can't ride this out forever. At some point, it's going to happen where they're going to realize that this just isn't working. And I think that Eckler's role is going to be diminished at some point in the near future. Yeah, it's an interesting case for sure. I did think they would add somebody in the, in the draft and the fact that they didn't is kind of perplexing, especially because Austin Eckler has been pretty vocally looking for a new contract and the chargers haven't offered it to him. And so it honestly seems kind of up in the air, whether he's even going to play for the chargers this season. I don't really know. I'm not a contract expert, so I don't know what the likelihood is of him holding out right now. He's certainly acting as if he doesn't want to play. So that's something to monitor. Um, But yeah, I mean, he's going off the board in startups as the RB nine. So that's certainly not a low price for a running back. Who's 27 Um, obviously has some deficiencies in his game coming up on a contract dispute. The problem is that's just the upside is so high, right? Because he, He's still going off as the RB three in underdog, uh, which is a half PPR format, by the way. So, you know, he really, really thrives in PPR, but even on a half PPR site, like underdog, he is going off as the RB three. Um, it's very difficult to decide when you're that high up in your, in your draft or that, you know, somebody that's that highly valued, are you going to really chase that ceiling? 
because he does have that RB one overall ceiling that we covet that not a lot of players have, but as you pointed out, he also has some pretty significant downside risk and we don't know what he would look like on another team because I think another Chargers, team would be really bad for him. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. I don't think there are a lot of situations he could go to where he wouldn't see a significant drop off in his usage where, you know, Justin Herbert has had a very low ADOT over the past couple of seasons. He has targeted Eckler at an, at a massive rate. The passing volume in general has been really, really high in Los Angeles. So this is a volatile situation. And I tend to agree that if I have Eckler on my team, I'm probably looking to move off of him into someone else. Like I will pay a, a premium price to move from Eckler into a Christian McCaffrey or into a Saquon Barkley. If you want to lock in that veteran production with a little more stability, I think it's worth giving a little X ex something extra or trading down from Eckler into, I don't know, like a Nick Chubb or something where you still have a relatively high ceiling. Um, but maybe the, the talent floor is a little bit higher, less likely to go South quickly. Another thing I forgot to mention about Eckler is that Joe Lombardi has gone now and he was the, the mind behind all of the Alvin Kamara PPR years. And uh, he was a big part, I think in Austin Eckler's passing game usage and him being gone is definitely going to, it's going to be a hit for Eckler. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point too. You keep, you keep coming at me with some, uh, some deep cuts here with the, the contract years, the coaching changes. I love it. I, I get really caught up in like the game theory of it all. And, and I often overlook some pretty obvious, uh, you know, contextual elements. So it's good. Call those out for me. Gotcha. Um, let's jump over to the buying side. Let's see. We talked about Javante as a sell JK Dobbins as a buy Austin Eckler as a sell. Why don't you give us another buy here? So who are we, who are we looking to go ahead and add to our teams? I already chirped a bit on cam Akers before, but he's the other guy I'm really targeting at the running back position. And there's not, there's not a ton more beyond Akers and Dobbins that I think are super great values at the moment, but all the things that I mentioned really um, earlier with contract year, I think he's going to get an insane amount of usage. Um, I think that the third down work could see an increase because of the way that we saw him pass block towards the end of last season. Um, I think that he's going to be getting a lot of high value touches in the red zone. Um, I think that he's just a good football player in general. I think he's a really elusive guy with some good power. And I think that his long speed is going to continue to get better as he gets further and further removed um, from the Achilles. I think that his burst will just only get more and more back to form. Um, and I think that the Rams offense as a whole is going to take a pretty big step in 2023 from 2022. So I like acres a lot. I'm kind of medium on acres and dynasty. Like, like I said, I, I think I maybe I have his ceiling a little lower than you do, and so it just makes him less exciting. He's he kind of just feels like an RB two, one of those guys where halfway through the season I might be, I might have three or four guys on my bench that, you know, have found themselves in starting roles that project similarly on a week to week basis. But if he does take on that third down role that you're talking about, if and if their offense is improved, then maybe I'm a little low on his on his actual potential. I guess he could see like a Josh Jacobs esque workload at certain points of the season which would definitely give him another another level of upside so i'm kind of coming around on acres a little bit i i actually actually i had him as my dynasty rb5 at one point i had him up right, there too <laughs> right before his his yep. injury so i have been hurt by acres it's not his fault of course um and I, I was super high on him as a prospect, and I thought he was going to come in and be this do-it-all guy. He looked so exciting down the stretch in his rookie season, but ultimately, it just it didn't it didn't pan out that way. But now at RB twenty four, maybe now is the time to get back in. It kind of comes in cycles with these injuries. Like Javante is early in that injury cycle, maybe he's more of a of a sell, and then you can get back in later when his cost is depressed. So you you just have to find the right time to buy in, and this might be the right time to buy into Acres. The I'm going to mention a cluster of players here that I think you can also be buying because they have very palatable prices. It's because they are quote unquote old. Uh, and that's like really a wide range of running backs that are all different values based mostly on the offenses they're in and their perceived talent levels. But honestly, all of the age 26 and older running backs that are still starters, most of them 
have pretty nice looking prices right now. I'll start at the top with Nick Chubb, who is the running back 14 in startups. So that's just one slot ahead of Javante Williams. He's going off the board and on, on underdog is the RB six. I would swap Javante for Nick Chubb in a heartbeat. Okay. If you can get Javante Williams off your team and add a little something extra to get Nick Chubb, I would totally do that because he's really good at football. Uh, he's going to produce this season potentially in a very good offense. Um, and honestly, we don't know when he's going to decline. The That's thing the about, one Cleveland Brown I'd, I'd buy for sure. Yeah, there you go. So we agree about a Cleveland Brown. You're going to have to go out and buy him. Um, <laughs> the running back aging curves are kind of a fallacy. Uh, running backs don't really decline in a linear fashion. Uh, the way that running back aging curves have been done Adam Harstad is the one who kind of pointed this out, but the aging curves take into account where all these different running backs stops being productive and then they average it out. And so you have some running backs that stop being productive at 26, some at 27, some at 28, some at 29. And then what it looks like is that you have this gradual decline in production over a number of years, but on an individual basis, what you're seeing is different running backs are good, 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 and then bad. Um, and it happens kind of all at once. So with Nick Chubb, we've seen no evidence that he is falling off. He, he hasn't lost his efficiency in the way we've seen from like Ezekiel Elliott, Dalvin cook, Joe Mixon. He still has it. Uh, so he's a guy that I feel you can just confidently roll out there year after year until he starts showing those signs of decline. And usually once those running backs do show those signs, they still get like one more season of high volume because they've kind of established themselves in the backfield. They have the coaches trust and you usually have an opportunity to even get out from those players before they fully tank. So at that price point, I'm very comfortable buying into Nick Chubb and Ben also endorsed it. So you're going to have to go out and buy him. And I hate and the Browns. So there you have it. So this Nick Chubb is just good enough to uh, to bridge that gap. And then I'll just run down the board. Okay, Joe Mixon, you can go ahead and get, get him. His startup ADP of RB21 feels a little bit high. It kind of seems like in some of my leagues, he's valued significantly lower than that. So maybe just go check in on the Mixon manager, see if they're not feeling it, uh, and see if you can get him. Because at this point, he seems pretty obviously the locked-in starter for the Bengals. They didn't bring in anybody else. I don't think he's going to get cut at this point. So... They're not going to roll into the season with Chase Brown and Chris Evans on the, on the roster and nothing else. So I think he's pretty much locked in. He's not very good, but he's going to get a lot of touches in this offense. It's a really good offense. So watch out for the cut pretty soon though. I, I, I'm, I am a little scared of Mixon getting released the money, the money side of it makes a lot of sense. So I agree. I agree on the money side, but I just don't see, it just feels like a high profile team like that would have done more to address the need. Like, what are, what are their options if they cut Mixon? Like, what can they actually do at this point? Because signing an Ezekiel they Elliott or a yeah. Leonard Fournette is like, that's not going to help them at all. You know, trading for Dalvin Cook's not going to help them. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I feel like they need a running back, and I don't think they're going to want to go into the season with with the guys they have as the starters. But that's we true. shall see. I, we I shall. Maybe we just see a, you know, a restructured contract or something. Uh, I'm not sure, but... At his price, I'm comfortable. Maybe you can flip somebody like Kendra Miller, who we talked about is close in value, uh, or even like a Jonathan Mingo or something. Get off of one of these unproven younger guys that don't really have good profiles and, and get somebody who's going to score some points. Even further down the board, probably the best buy out of all of them is James Conner because he has absolutely no competition to speak of. He's going to get a million touches and yes, he is washed, uh, but so are a bunch of these other running backs that are valued more highly for some reason. All he does is just soak up volume, both in the receiving game and on the ground when he doesn't have any competition around him. So he was like a borderline RB one last year too. James Conner is a great value right now. I'd, I'd I definitely be. In. I think he might have been an RB one in points per game even, but yeah, yeah, he's he's like the he's the RB thirty five in startups right now. So. He's going after Brian Robinson. So if That's you can go ridiculous. trade He's trade sorry. Brian Robinson for James Conner, uh, score some points. Absolutely. Yeah, and 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 buy some other veterans too, which I, I kind of want to veer into that towards the end of the show here. Veteran players are only going to get more expensive as the offseason progresses because their points, the points they're projected to score are going to become more and more important as dynasty managers stop looking at their lineups in terms of like, you know, how pretty they are, how nice a screenshot of their lineup looks and how actually the points are going to start being scored. Um, so guys like Keenan Allen, I think are, is a great buy right now. 
uh, guys like we've mentioned, these running backs. Um, who are some other veteran players we could point out for people? Because I think like, D Hop is a really good one that that you that you mentioned in on on the sheet, and I think that there's a little bit of cloudiness around him because we don't know where he's going to be next year, and if he stays in Arizona, that would really sorry that would really suck. Um, but he's just such a good football player and he's been so good for so long. And he was so good when he showed up last year that like, you have to imagine that wherever he goes, the team's going to be in on him is their potentially number one target earner. So, yeah, that's, that's true. I do like Hopkins. I think as it becomes more and more likely that he's doomed to remain in Arizona, it's kind of kept his value depressed and that also kind of makes me depressed, but, uh, <laughs> really sucks, man. yeah, I mean, you know, looking at half a season of like Colt McCoy or I think it'd be more Toon than half or whoever Gosh. throwing them the ball. It it's concerning at his age as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but the flip side of that is if he's moved tomorrow, you know, if he gets traded to the bills tomorrow, you're going to wish he was on your roster. So maybe we just go out and we get good players and we let the situations kind of sort themselves out. He's not incredibly cross cost prohibitive at his current price of wide receiver 38 in startup. So definitely a guy you can go out and get uh, Darren Waller. We mentioned earlier is maybe the last, he's probably the cheapest of the potential high end tight ends you can get. Um, yeah. And, and even, you know, some quarterbacks, if you can get in on a, like a Geno Smith or something. Cheap. Geno Smith is a great value right now. Him and Derek Carr, I think, are both like super undervalued with the with with the production you could be getting out of them. I think that those those are guys that if you really needed to, you could plug them into like a QB one spot, um, at least for like the next year or two. Um, so you, you can go ahead, but yeah, yeah those guys no, get me I, excited, man. <laughs> I, I'm all for buying them. I I I do not want Derek Carr in my QB one slot. I'm just gonna go ahead and say that right now. <laughs> Uh, I am a, I'm kind of an elite QB or bust kind of guy, but he, if you can pick him up on the cheap, you know, I don't want to be moving first round picks for these types of players. I want to be very clear here. You don't want to be addressing your positions of need, especially with like future draft capital this early in the off season. But yeah. if you can package together some lesser assets or you can like move up from a, from like a Mac Jones or something. Uh, relatively cheap and get one of these guys, I definitely think that's an upgrade because they will be very startable for you. They, they're they going to put up QB2 numbers at least, and that's something you need in Superflex. You, you really need to have that high floor of production because it's the highest scoring position. Yeah. So definitely look at those guys. At all positions, look for veteran players. Um, and even if you don't think you're a super strong contender, I want to I want to get into some of these roster management tips, maybe the kind of the abbreviated version here, but don't count yourself out as a contender, especially right now in May. Like you might have a super low value roster. Maybe you have a very very bad team. You took over an orphan or you made some really bad choices and you know that your team is totally shot. Okay, fair enough. Make your moves to to tank this season, pick up some future capital. But for the most part, if you have some like quote unquote, you know, middle of the pack team, please don't blow it up now in May because first of all, the high value assets that you have, like I, we just said, they're going to be more valuable uh, come the season when they're scoring points. But second of all, I think way too many teams count themselves out of contention when they actually have more of a shot than they think, because variance variance is a fickle, fickle beast. Uh, it, it shines on us in some moments and in other moments we get totally screwed uh, you know, number one seeds get bounced by number six seeds. It, it, it happens all the time. So you need to be open to just making the playoffs and then letting the chips fall where they may, uh, Ben, how do you approach? Cause I've been talking forever. How do you approach your rosters at this time of the year and kind of figuring out where you're at in terms of the, the rebuild versus contention mindset? That's a super good point because getting caught in the middle is a death sentence in dynasty. You really never want to do that because then you're just throwing your 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 buy in to whoever winds up actually going all in. Um, I have a couple teams, a couple orphans that I picked up where I sort of blew up the roster as soon as I got it because I was like, oh, this team sucks. And those rosters keep me up at night. Like you were saying, there's so much value that's going to keep appreciating over the offseason. And even when you get into the actual season and teams realize that they're a contender when they didn't think they were a contender, then they're looking to buy veterans who are going to produce for them now. Maybe they get 
a random injury to their RB1 and you have James Conner, so you sell James Conner to them. Um, it really it doesn't make any sense to be, and I know that we all love trading as dynasty players, but right now there's really no rush. There's no reason to be wheeling and dealing all of your assets right now. This is sort of a chill time where we can all like, if unless we're seeing in, incredible value coming our way, I would, I would kind of just be vibing, honestly. That's what that's sort of what I think we should be doing right now. I know that's a, little, be, a bit of a weird answer, but just be vibing. Yeah, no, just, I, I, I'm with you. <laughs> you. You don't need to force yourself. I, it's very tricky. It's a, it's kind of a tightrope you have to walk because I agree. You do not want to be caught in the middle. Um, but I think for some people, that's like, well, if I'm not an obvious top two team in the league, I need to be the worst team in the league. And it doesn't mean that, especially now, because things can definitely change over the course of the offseason. Like some situations are still fluid. Some depth charts are still sorting themselves out. There are some players we think are going to be really good that aren't. And there are some players that are going to be the opposite. So if you are not clearly you know, a bottom three team in the league, you need to be open to contending. You, you need to keep the door open. That doesn't mean go ship off your 2025 first to go get some RB2. You know, don't trade your R, your future first for Cam Akers, I beg of you, because you have an RB, you know, a need at running back and you want to contend. But hold on to some of those competitive, those players that give you an advantage, those Keenan Allen types uh, that we talked about that are going to produce this year. And just wait and see what options become available, right? Where can you sneak in some more firepower let the season begin just uh, you know are you winning games yeah just just let it go because as long as you have a reasonable chance to make the playoffs without sacrificing a bunch of your future market value in the process just stay the course you don't want to be like the first or second team to miss the playoffs that obviously sucks but there's nothing wrong with making the playoffs as the fifth or the sixth seed that doesn't even always mean you're the worst playoff team because some teams start out hot and then tail off. Some teams start out slow and pick up momentum as the season goes along. Uh, so you can enter the playoffs as the fifth seed and still have one of the better teams in the playoffs. And, and regardless, anything can happen in a one week playoff matchup. Like you can have the projection totally favor you and you can still lose no matter how good your team is. You're always going to have lesser odds than you think to win. And no matter how bad your team is, you're probably going to have better odds than you think to win. So you want to just kind of get yourself a seat at the table uh, and let things play out. And you don't want to kill your playoff potential before you actually have to. Because at the end of the day, you do have to pay for that season. And even if you do tank and build up your quote-unquote super team, the odds that you're going to go you know, back-to-back -back or win three championships in a row because you, you, know, you tanked for two seasons, that rarely ever pans out. Because so many guys come and go, value fluctuates. It's just, it's better to just sort of stay in the thick of it over and over again, as opposed to like planning to be dominant in the future for like five seasons in a row. At the end of the day, it's still fantasy football. As much as as much fun as it is to trust the process and get five firsts and in each rookie draft and build up a super team of young players, it's still fantasy football and the same truths that have always held since we all started playing redraft leagues and we went out and we targeted our big running backs and stuff like that. All of those truths still hold where good players score points and you want to keep good players on your team because you want to score points. Well said, very well said. Now we'll close out with the flip side of this, which is being too aggressive and trying to address your team needs. So I've, I've been trying to to state this stuff clearly so I don't contradict myself and I, and I don't know if I'm doing a very good job, you but great. you, you want to keep the competitive window open. You don't want to mm -hmm. force yourself into tanking. Um, however, you don't want to start paying up for positions of need immediately right now in May and trying to get players just because you need a running back or you need a tight end. Um, that is the worst reason to make a trade in May. Now you can go out and get a tight end if you get, one that you think is good at a good price. Uh, you can do that at any position at any time, but you don't want to go out and put yourself at a disadvantage in trade negotiations because you are actively just trying to fill out your lineup. Your lineup does not matter right now. So how do you walk that line, Ben, when you're trying to make trades? Because we all love to make trades. How do you avoid getting too fixated on the weaknesses of your team? I think that the main thing that I've been thinking about to guide my trade 
process this off season has just been how can I accrue value and add value to my rosters? Because I'm not, like you said, it's May. I'm not putting any of these guys actually in my lineup. I still have Jamison Williams in all of my starting lineups because <laughs> I put my highest value players in my starting lineup. Um, so yeah, I'm just, I'm looking to, if I have a team that seems to be a little depleted, I'm looking to move big studs and downgrade to a slightly lesser player and add a pick on t- on top of that or something like that um a lot of a lot of stuff like that where i'm just trying to pick up value find guys who are trying to take an upside swing and um just build up a, a strong basis because adding value is the the one thing that is really tricky to just do you actually have to usually take actionable movements to in order to add value to your teams um so that's that's sort of what I'm what I'm looking to do right now. I'm I'm really not doing anything major though at the moment, like we've been saying. Yeah, I think the the perspective of adding value makes a lot more sense at this point in the off season. Like it shifts once you get in season. You still want to consider the value of your team because you have to think about the years that come next because this is dynasty. But right now we want to think about like you said, making our, just making our rosters more valuable, right? It's like, we're trying to just kind of fill up the piggy bank with as much money as possible so that when we have to break it open and go out and buy things like positions that we need, now we have the funds that we need, but we just want to be flexible. So we want to be acquiring assets that are fluid. And that's always future draft picks. You can, even if you think you're a contender, go out and get somebody's 24 first. I promise you, you will not regret it. I traded, I traded, I went out and traded Chris Godwin in a league where I'm the defending champion for some dudes 2024 20, first because his his roster is terrible and I know it's a top 5 pick. Um but That's I awesome. saw the oppor- I saw the opportunity to make that deal and while it seems counterintuitive as a contender to trade away a pretty decent player for a future draft pick, the rest of the league also knows that that's a top 5 pick and when the season comes I can just go send that pick away for a much better player if I really need to, yeah. um, you know, or I can maneuver in other ways and hold on to that high value asset and still keep myself in contention. You know, you just have to be open to these different possibilities. Um, but like you said, tearing down uh, of players is also a good thing to do rather than just trying to address your needs. Look at hone in on players. You think are good bets that are, or, or bad bets. If you have a player on your roster that you think is a bad bet, try to move him off your roster. Uh, either picking up value to like move down a tier or paying up a little bit to jump up a tier into a guy you think is more likely to be good for your team. Like moving off of an Austin Eckler into a Saquon Barkley was something we talked about earlier. Make those kinds of moves, position yourself within tiers to benefit the most from volatile situations to benefit from, um, you know, future draft capital, all all that kind of stuff. Um, but, thinking of it that way, as opposed to, well, you know, my RB two slot is weak or my tight end slot is weak. That is really going to benefit you in the long run because you don't want to be shipping off future draft capital or young potential for, you know, guys like miles Sanders, guys like Evan Ingram or like Kirk cousins, because you have a need that, that just is how you end up building the opposite of a super team, you know, a, a super low value team that ends up having to be like a two year rebuild. And I know because I've been there. There comes a time when you want to put all your eggs in one basket, and right now is just the time to go get more eggs. That's pretty much what we're saying. <laughs> Love it. Go get more eggs. Absolutely. Go put more eggs in the basket. Um, don't worry about which basket they're in uh, as it stands. Yep. You can always and, flip uh, it later. You yeah. Can always flip it later. Absolutely. Okay, perfect. Well, I think we got to most of the main bullet points despite running a little bit long on the the first part of it that ranking those rankings were just too fun to talk about so they it kind of it yeah. kind of dragged things out a little bit do but, those all day <laughs> yeah absolutely um as always in dynasty there's so much more we could talk about but we won't belabor the point we will uh we'll close things out are there any final thoughts you have been because I, I know there were some bullet points that we didn't get to i'm sure you have some killer killer other notes for it is there anything you want to just end this on like you could throw out whatever you want hmm anything i want I would say I'm going to double down. Go sell Austin Eckler. Just go squeeze all of that value that you can get out of him right now because the upside is still there and I don't want you to be holding the bag. So you're welcome. There you go. Okay. Anthony sell Richardson, Austin Eckler. Quarterback one. That too. And Anthony Richardson, QB1. <laughs> is that in Dynasty or in the rookie class? 
in the rookie class still not not fully there yet okay maybe. <laughs> i was really i was a little concerned for a second okay i'm with i'm with you there anthony richardson rookie qb1 we gotta parade that every chance fantastic yeah um okay well i'll throw out one more thing uh because we were going to talk a little bit about uh dynasty uh rookie draft waiver ads so guys that might be there after your drafts i do want to highlight ty on evans because we talked about cam Akers and how he has no competition uh they did draft zach evans in the sixth round they also added ty on evans as a udfa um just kind of an interesting spot because of the lack of depth so go pick up ty on evans and put him on your bench go drop some roster clogging wide receiver like uh robert woods and just pick up a running back and see what happens. He probably had another one there. Brenton yeah. strange. Evan Ingram is still playing on the franchise tag. I don't think he signed his franchise tag tender. They're working out an extension, but if they don't, or if it winds up being a short extension, the Jaguar spent a decent pick on Brenton strange. So he's a pretty solid pickup right now as well. All right. Brenton strange, second round tight end. Yeah. He is going undrafted pretty frequently in rookie drafts. So that could be a guy you could stash as well. I'm always on board with stashing some, running backs and tight ends with upside even if it's very thin levels of upside as opposed to holding on to players like paris campbell terrace marshall Mecole hardman i don't i don't want those bottom of the barrel wide receivers give me the running backs give me the tight ends that have a chance to maybe make an impact at some point so those are some good call outs this has been another great episode of the factory tour ben thanks a lot for coming on obviously look to have you back at some point this summer talk about some more stuff see how things are progressing, see how our takes are aging, hopefully well. So I will, uh, I'll close it out here. Um, ben, you have a great night and uh, everybody else. I will see you next week on the factory tour.